This is the Wheel of Time podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Season 2, Episodes 1, 2, and 3. Egwene is strong, stronger than most. But you, you have ten times that power, Nynaeve, whether you want it or not. Five months now in this tower, and you haven't channeled. Not once. Whatever block is holding you back, it's time to break through. Fellow wheelies, the wheel is weaving and it will weave again. We are back for season two of The Wheel of Time. I am one of your hosts, Chris. Hello there, fellow wheelies. I am one of your other weaving hosts, John. And running right at the group, I am Derek. Yeah, yeah. Welcome back and welcome back to the world of The Wheel of Time. Mm-hmm. Wow. How long? It's like, it's a good 18 months now at this stage. Yeah, I think it was uh, 2021, the start of 2021. Yes. Yep. And it has been, it's, it's been a long wait, but um, I am happy, spoilers I guess, happy to report. I'm so happy to be back in season two and, oh, it's so good. So good. <laughs> but we have lots to discuss. Yes. Mm-hmm. Season two aired on Friday the 1st of September and they dropped episodes one, two and three in one go. So rather than break it out, because there's a lot to discuss, especially scattered over the three episodes, and we know everyone binged the first three episodes, we're going to do a mega episode discussion on all three episodes. But it's going to continue going forward, back to usual one episode a week, starting from next week. But should we jump in, gentlemen, to really just kind of the meat and the bones of what this episode is. Absolutely. Okay, before we get into it, and before I hand it over to Derek for the episode details, don't forget, we do have our Wheel of Time Tavern Quiz at the end of this episode. We'll be giving out the first three questions, because obviously there's three episodes at the end. Gather together all the answers to the eight questions and email it to Feedback at TV Podcast Industries dot com and do that at the end of the season and you could potentially get your hand on some wheel of time goodies and if you enjoy what you like and you enjoy listening to us you can pop on over to tvpodcastindustries.com and ensure that you are subscribed to each of our feeds so it is there it is on all of the catchers as well but while you're there make sure you like rate subscribe and all those fun things if you have any feedback you can email it to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or you can pop on over to our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries where each and every episode has its own spoiler post you can drop it in there and we'll discuss it at the end of our discussions. But gentlemen, as I said, I think it's time Derek tells us who gave us what with these episodes. Over to you, Derek. Excellent. There's lots here because there is three episodes, of course. So uh, for the first time this season, the show is based on the book series by Robert Jordan, completed by Brandon Sanderson. Executive producers for the show are Rafe Judkins, Larry Mondragon, Rick Selvage, Ted Field, Mike Weber, Darren Lemke, Margot Kehoe, Justin Joel Gilmer, Sana Hamira, and Amanda Kate Schumann. The showrunner for the show is Rafe Lee Judkins. Episode 1, A Taste of Solitude, was written by Amanda Kate Schumann. Uh, this is her third episode of Wheel of Time. Episode 2, Strangers and Friends, was written by Catherine B. McKenna. The second episode of Wheel of Time. And episode 3, What Might Be, was written by John McCutcheon. This is his first episode of Wheel of Time. Good stuff. Uh, yeah. Various levels of involvement. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Yeah. Like it. Uh, Episode 1 and 2 were directed by Thomas Knapper. Uh, He was a second unit director on many movies, including the live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. And along with that, he was also a second unit director on the Oscar-nominated The Darkest Hour. Very good. And the third episode was directed by executive producer Sana Hamira. Um, This is our first episode of Wheel of Time, following loads of TV shows, from Shameless Glee to American Horror Story and Empire. Interesting. 
Mm, what a nice little range there. Yeah. Yeah, she's done lots and lots of TV shows. Yeah, good stuff. So, John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your epic synopsis for the first three episodes of Wheel of Time Season 2? Sure. Yes, fellow wheelies, this is a rather large one, so apologies. A meeting of dark friends occurs where Ishmael, the Dark One's strongest servant, decides to observe Randall Thor, the Dragon Reborn, instead of killing him. After the events at the Eye, Moraine has been living with Adelas and Verin, her fellow Aesid Eye, gathering information on the coming battle. Moraine all the time struggles with the loss of the One Power, and her bond with her warder Lan begins to weaken as she increasingly pushes him away. Moraine leaves to follow up on her plans alone, but is attacked and wounded by the Three Fades, and is only saved by the Weave and Warder of Varin and Adelas. Meanwhile, Rand has gone into hiding in Carhain, and has developed a relationship with an innkeeper called Selene. Working at a hospice where he looks after a war-damaged swordsman called Errol, his true intention to gain access to the false dragon Legane, who is a patient there, comes to fruition. After bringing a bottle of wine as a price for the information, Rand asks Legain to teach him how to control the One Power without going mad, but Legain reveals that the power can't be controlled. Believing Randall Thor to be dead, Egwene and Nynaeve have started their Ace of Eye training as novices at the White Tower. Egwene is determined to succeed, but is frustrated by the lack of praise, and has become jealous of Nynaeve, who is praised as one of the most powerful Ace of Eye to have ever entered the Tower. As Egwene's friendship with Nynaeve becomes strained, she befriends Elaine Tracand, the daughter heir of Andor, who has come to study at the White Tower. However, Nynaeve struggles to channel the One Power, except when angry or afraid. The Red Aja Leandrin wants to train Nynaeve despite her past history with novices, and pushes for Nynaeve to undergo the testing and become an accepted, which would allow her to train Nynaeve. In the depths of the White Tower... Matt has been imprisoned in the tower by Leandrin at Moraine's request. As he tries to escape his cell, he chisels through to another cell, instead meeting Min, who he befriends. Min, who has a special ability to touch the One Power to see future events, has also been locked up by Leandrin, and as she gets to know Matt, sees a vision of Matt stabbing Rand. Meanwhile, Perrin and Loyal have joined a company of Shinarans, led by Ingtar Shinoa, to hunt for the Horn of Valer and Padim Fane, who stole it from Faldara. They are joined by a sniffer, Elias, who takes an interest in Perrin. After coming across a massacre of innocent people, and with a fade nailed to a wall, they travel to a small village, which is attacked by a sentient force. Perrin, Loyal, and the Shinarans are captured. As the sentient leader, Saroth, arrives along with Ishmael, they are forced to swear fealty to the Sension, and Ismail is intrigued by Perrin, and encourages him to unleash his inner beast. Elsewhere, Moraine and Lan recover after the attack from the Fades, and prepare to leave for the White Tower, despite Moraine being exiled by the Amaralin. While on their way there, Verin deduces that Moraine found the Dragon Reborn, and intends to serve him no matter what. Moraine releases Lan from her service, claiming that he can't protect her anymore, and has Alana and her warders escort him to the tower. In the White Tower, Nynaeve undergoes her accepted test, which involves facing trials inside Tarangriel arches. Nynaeve passes two of the trials, but on the third seemingly fails after choosing a life with Lan inside the arches over becoming an Aes Sedai. Leandrin and the other Aes Sedai believe her to be dead, and Elaine has to comfort a grieving Egwene. Leandrin releases Matt to comfort Egwene, which he opts not to do, but also has Min follow him. Inside the archers, Nynaeve's life with Lan is ruined by a trollic attack, and she escapes back to the real world and is embraced by a shocked Egwene. And breathe out, <laughs> fellow wheelies. Well yes. done, John. Yes, trying to get three into one. Uh-huh. Uh, not even the Spice Girls could achieve that. <laughs> three but become you can't one. Can't win a Turk and Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> that has become a thing. I mean, I know the. That really has become a thing. The John had never heard of a Tadurkin until about two months ago, and then it suddenly appeared on loads of shows we were watching. Yeah, it's all it over from? the show. 
<laughs> We're not even at Thanksgiving yet uh, in the US. Well, who would go to the trouble to stuff like a million birds into uh, one another? It's like, it's crazy. <laughs> well, apparently, if you, you want that taste, taste you got to get it. Mm-hmm. Much like this, our discussion on this episode, we need to break it down in order to savor it in the most important way. Mm-hmm. But you mean let's cook get them into separately? Our... Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into our discussions with our. Five spokes on the wheel. Our first discussion point, our first spoke of the Wheel of Time discussion is on each of the characters and it's going to be Matt is our first spoke. Let's chat about Matt's journey across these three because we we didn't really know 100% of kind of where they were taking it with this Mm -hmm. because they had changed it from the books. So this is a new type of kind of discussion point for a lot of us as those who have read it and or those who are kind of journeying with the, the show for the first time yeah, but like um me. he's there he's been in prison for months in the white terror yeah absolutely La- last we saw him he was watching as the rest of the group um disappeared with moraine and they kind of left him behind um lots of references throughout throughout these episodes about the friendship group wanting to have matt back and and wondering where he is and maybe He'll join them again in future. So, um, so the, he is top of mind for everybody. But effectively, yeah, trapped in the White Tower here um, under Leandra's watch. Um, she seems pretty annoyed that she's been given this duty by Moraine, doesn't she? Yes, she does yeah. a bit. Um, <laughs> she's kind of exasperated by by Matt here. Yeah. Um, yes, and of course, played by a new actor here, Donald Finn. Mm. Um, and at the end of last season, there was this tower and. I think I thought he was at Andor, didn't think he was um, uh, at, at the White Tower. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, he's been in prison there. Yeah. And we just heard Moraine send out the red I said I to yeah. pick up Matt, basically. But it almost seems like it's to it's it's almost like uh, him in an isolation chamber, mm-hmm. so that you know to make sure that he has kind of got over his addiction of the the ruby encrusted dagger that he got at Shire Le Goth, mm-hmm. yeah. um in the, in the first season. But uh, I do like here Matt. Uh, like Matt is really one of my favorite characters from the book. So right. I, I do like here how he puts up a front with Leandrin, but ultimately is beavering away to escape his his cell. Oh, um, that moment where she locks him in the room, I love how Donald Finn plays that as he's counting the steps and, and hearing the lock yeah. go. Yeah, it's that just, was really cool. Just timing it perfectly so he knows this is the longest period of time before somebody comes back into the room, so I have my opportunity to dig my way through the wall. And then his reaction when he breaks through the wall and realize, oh, God, it's another cell. <laughs> it's really good. Really good. And then you just see Min's head pop in. <laughs> yes. Now, we met Min last season as well. She was yes. in the um, the inn that all of the crew came to, and she had a vision about this group of friends. Yes. Yeah. So she's now been captured by the Aes Sedai. Yes. Like- captured, question mark. It, it, it's... So yeah, we, like she, she has, she has a ability to see potential futures. Sorry, you're absolutely right. Sorry, yes. When you combine the end of the episode at the beginning of the episode, it seems like she's under. Yes, she's been captured. By the end of the third episode, you realize she's working for Leandra. Yeah, yeah, and of course, it's also that Leandra can see straight through Matt, despite all his yes. acting and, and sort of trying to feign just complete disinterest in anything Mm -hmm. you know there is a reason why min is in this cell next to mass yes um but i do like the the two of them coming together here Mm -hmm. Uh, min is a a really good character for me uh and to see her back again uh, but also to see you know she has another vision here of matt effectively Mm -hmm. knifing grant probably killing him so Mm. you know that's kind of interesting because I, i'm not entirely sure whether she has much of a you know an error rate here i think it's pretty sort of bet in what she sees yes but the other thing is is that matt rand perrin they also have the ability to bend and manipulate or distort i guess the weave around um, oh, interesting. Them as well. So that's something that we see in the books and we might see later in the show. Yeah, I mean, not... it's been referenced by Moraine okay. uh, in season one right. as well. Oh, that's how they stayed hidden, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're kind of 
you know, they're important, but they're important also because they have this ability to not only go with the weave uh, mm -hmm. as it wills, okay. but also they can distort it by their presence. Excellent. Um, so they're called Taveran. Um, yes, yes. And maybe there's a bit of that influencing men here because mm -hmm. otherwise that's quite a big thing, at least for me, yeah. seeing this. Uh, but it's interestingly as well, the knife he is using is the ruby encrusted one from Shire yeah. Legoth as well. Yeah. So just the, the, the one thing is just with men, the visions usually aren't literal. That's the interesting thing. She like previously, like she had just seen a white flame around Nynaeve and Egwene when she saw them. Yeah. She saw um, uh, lights swirling around Rand, being sucked up by him. Uh, she saw a, a hammer and a sword with, or I think it was a hammer and an axe with Perrin, right? And him covered in blood. Mm. So there, there are. She she sees potentials and kind of mm -hmm. it's almost like uh, fortune telling to a degree. Yeah, and and the big difference in this world is because the weaves are so central to this world. She can see part of the weaves yes, and she exactly. interprets it in a certain way yeah. that other people can't do. That's yeah. that's what I get from it. A reminder to our listeners: I suppose we should have said that up front in case you weren't with us for season one. I'm the non-book reader, so I'm here to ask the uh, unusual questions of. Our two book readers, John and Chris. Um, I hate to say I'm a non-book reader. I just just Robert Jordan's books. Are you, you sure? I haven't read these. Yeah. Books. yeah, I've read other books. <laughs> and Chris is the mega book reader yes. of Robert yeah. Jordan, whereas I'm up to. I'm still reading book four. Yes, but you were only on book one last season, so uh, yes. did pretty yeah. good. <laughs> um, overall, this gets interesting because mm -hmm. where where do they go with this? Matt Donald Finn plays the cheeky chap of Matt. <laughs> Yeah. Down to a T. Very yeah, well. But absolutely. also is able to get that emotional resonance mm. in really, really well. Yeah, because um, there's another big move here. Um, af well, we'll talk about the other characters later, but uh, after we lose Nynaeve, um, Matt is offered the chance to go and meet with Egwen and comfort her for this great loss. And he chooses not to. He turns away before she even sees him. So, yeah. um Again, there's that feeling with Matt that he doesn't want to connect with this group or he he wants to separate himself from this group. And also, I think with Matt, that the, there is a burden that comes mm. with him from the two rivers because yeah. of his family. Yeah. Um, and it mm -hmm. always comes through. It's, it's almost like he sees himself as the outsider to this group exactly. anyway, yeah. even though they embrace him totally. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and so that always kind of follows him a bit. Um, it just, it just came as a surprise. It felt like one of those moments that you, you know, that would be echoed in other, in other series like Lord of the Rings, let's say, where you have two members of a group that are split apart and this is the moment when they come back together. You know, you kind of felt that was going to happen. And then for Matt to just turn on his heels team up with men and, and leave the city i was like wait hang on a second this is where they're all reunited right <laughs> yeah but he, and he's all he's always been the more reluctant yeah. uh of this party and hence he didn't travel to faldara in, yeah. Yeah. in season one mm -hmm. so I, I you know i think there's a lot of baggage that matt has yeah. it's not that he doesn't want to be part of that group but he's he is that person who is part of the group but is also happy to go off and just do his own thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it, it's good to now know where where Matt has been yeah. uh, since season one, and it's great that he's uh, connecting uh, with with Min here, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly they're about to head off on the road. And um, for what purpose? It'll be interesting. It seems because, to be for Leander's purpose. <laughs> yeah, well, it it does, and that is interesting to me, mm -hmm. uh, given where I am in the book because okay. Min, you know, feels like an ally of of this group um mm. within the books. Whereas Leandrin's goals are very different, uh mm. wildly so from uh this group and Moraine. And indeed mm -hmm. she she does say you and me will be free of Moraine's power. Yes. She and it, it, it's us probably why Min is going along with her because mm -hmm. Moraine has this sort of almost wants to keep an eye on Min because of her power. Yeah. Uh, but Min is also like Matt, and that's why it's great to see them as bedfellows, and um, doesn't want to be 
an Aes Sedai either. Yeah. Right. And it, it's going to be interesting to see. Like the, this yeah. is a change from the books. Usually mm-hmm. it's Matt and Rand at this point in the, in the books, theoretically, oh, right. when they're off on their journeys. So seeing that them travel this way is unique. And I, it depends on what they're going to do with this. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, you know, as you say, Chris, it's like the, there's a lot of changes here to the the flow, at least of the first four books for me, yeah. let alone what comes after. Um, and I guess a lot of stuff is happening that is maybe being pulled from later books. But at the same time, um, sort of overall, it's very familiar yeah. in terms exactly. of where they are That's in the, the books, yeah. which is really kind of a good trick to pull off here, mm-hmm. I think, from the showrunner. And the yeah. races. So for what I find most interesting is this feels like it, it could be ripped straight from the book. Right. Parts of it is, parts of it's not, parts of it's kind of just sped up, parts of it's in just different places. And I think they're weaving it, hey, uh, <laughs> this story in a way that I'm like, oh, no, this doesn't feel like rushed. Yeah. There's no jump in the character. Um, but they're also foreshadowing quite a lot. Right. Like yeah. they're doing things in a way that... We'll still make book readers and people who are the mega fans go, oh, my God, that's that, 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 that. Yeah. Like everything from colors to shadows to the music to there's a sound effect with Matt of dice kind okay. of jump, re- jumbling yeah. um, mm-hmm. at the very end. That plays a huge part thematically later. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like – all the way down towards the end of the the whole series, like very, there's a very. thing around dice and things like that, but just it's so faint. Yeah. In episode three, right at the end when he's running, mm-hmm. you wouldn't hear. It wasn't. It was very subtle. Very good. And I'm yeah. like enough to make me go, oh my god, they're they're foreshadowing this. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so I'm happy with where they're taking this. Mm-hmm. I was I I was wary with Donald coming in, thinking mm-hmm. he'd be a bit. Okay, how are they going to explain it? Are they going to play? Like, because I think when we were talking about, we knew at the end of season one that yeah. he Matt wasn't coming back, the, the it, original actor. Exactly, and, and like, in fact, Donald Finn had started filming his scenes yes. while the filming for season one was finishing. So we thought we might see him uh, yeah. in the series. Uh, interestingly, in the flashbacks, uh, they still included the original actor. Yeah, that was that was, yeah. But I thought they might be doing like the, it's a mask or something. Uh, I thought they might say, like, oh, it's a weave on him. It was a right. channel. It's a mask to make him look like someone else. But hey. No, I think they're just rolling with it. It's like, yeah, fact, exactly. it happens. And I think it's yeah. the best way of doing it. Definitely. Otherwise, exactly. it kind of gets, ooh. Exactly. Um, but no, great great choices here um, for the story. As a, as a person who hasn't read the books, I think this is a, a great way to reintroduce Matt as a character. And I'm, I'm really intrigued to see uh how it's going to work you know as i say some surprises there for me and one of the things you mentioned last season like there's 15 books in robert jordan's series of uh of wheel of time so they're never going to have 15 seasons of the show it's no. not it's not going to happen um so they will have to bring things forward and move things Absolutely. around so that they can yeah. cover the kind of area and territory i suppose that he covers within that that range of books the good news though in case we haven't mentioned it is season three is coming so they are already yeah. uh, working on season three they'll get back to that once the uh, once all the strikes are over but um that's already been confirmed and, and commissioned from prime video so the series will continue but uh, but yeah they, they will have to bring things forward from other books i just hope that the reaction from fans of Wheel of Time isn't like the reaction from fans of The Witcher, where they just started turning it off when they started merging things and changing things from the books. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's a great series so far. Seemingly, the the first three episodes, it, 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 it's getting great reactions. Um, it's number one streaming on uh, Prime, uh, I think, across the US, UK, all the major, mm-hmm. all the major territories. It was yeah. the number one streaming since we're recording this on the third. Mm-hmm. So I, I, and I said from kind of on X Twitter, kind of just <laughs> watching, kind of looking at the, the things and like, yeah, it's huge. It's yeah. the, the reaction has been fantastic, which leads me to believe season three is going to continue as long as they don't. They've still got a few more episodes. We still got five episodes in season two, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, we we've said certain things with like this before, with like 
Picard and things like, oh, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to get better. It's a, oh, oh, season two. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> and then we I had think, season three of Picard. So yeah, exactly. All good. All good. Yeah. Uh, excellent stuff. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out here as well to uh, Kate Fleetwood, who's playing uh, Leandrin in the series. Uh, yes. he seems to, her role seems to have elevated in this season um, more than last season. And I really think she's stepped up to be a really interesting character every time she's on oh, screen she's excellent. really really enjoying her yeah uh, but just at this moment here where she's with matt um there's some really interesting beats that she has here and she has some great beats later on and with uh the other major sets of characters at, uh, at the white terror so uh, definitely wanted to shout out her performance here yes uh but let us move on to our second spoke moraine and lan mm. so again you know we have moraine dealing with being cut off from the the one power and mm-hmm. um, and the weave and it's she has ended up at Verin's house uh Verin with uh Adeles and the their warder Thomas uh so mm-hmm. I'm really pleased they brought Verin in like this actually and um I just loved the tension here you know Moraine and Lan are almost like inseparable in season one and mm-hmm. here it's just that fracture between the two of them probably partly because she has been cut off from the weave. Well, yeah. But also, you know, there is Lan wanting to still be the faithful warder, but she's just pushing him away. And yeah. I think there's a, the fun little bit is the Lan as this thirst trap for Adelaus <laughs> as well. Um, well he's you know really what? wanting his pants off basically uh, she is not wrong um yeah that uh, that opening scene with lan uh training was uh, i can see um i can see why she's uh, thirsty <laughs> but i love that where it's like uh you know in this really hot <laughs> sun it must be really difficult to train with those pants of yours on. <laughs> really good really good um i also love how lan describes the relationship between him and moraine and how much it's changed since she's lost connection um he describes it as they always had a friend between them having the conversation between them that needed to happen and now there's silence uh, with this breaking of their bond. I thought that was a really good description about um about how close their connection was before now and and, and where it is now. I thought that was really well done. Yeah, no no, I re- I really enjoyed this and, and especially just the how broken Moraine is. Uh, but mm. I just the so she looks determined, she looks strength, she's the the epitome of mm-hmm. Ace of die kind of carrying those buckets, kind of like just playing Desmordere with uh, the uh, mm-hmm. the merchant. Yet, we see her in the bath, and you just see this yes. yeah. broken woman crying, trying to reach out, yeah. trying to touch the source, uh, trying to slide in and kind of really make those weaves yeah. and... And that's a call back to that season one scene with her and Lan in the bath where she warmed up the water, basically yeah. just a simple weave that she was doing. And now she can't exactly. even do that simple weave. So having a cold bath is not a, not a good experience for Murray. <laughs> yeah. No. And it's just, it, it's fun to watch just this. So it was just, you're seeing this dichotomy of a character where you do see her being strong, mm-hmm. bullish, pig-headed, some might yes. say. Especially with Lan. But then you also see the vulnerable side where she will mm, skip okay. forward slightly yeah. to the fates. The fates, like yeah. she goes to on her run. She's trying to run away to, to, to kind of leave Lan there and kind of go out on. I'm, we're, I'm mm. assuming to find Rand yeah. uh, and chase him down. Um, but then she's attacked by three fades. Lan, she barely kind of. She kills one herself and, but then nearly dies mm. to, to the second and third. Lan comes in. Yeah. He nearly dies to the, to the other two and is saved yeah. by Varen and Tomas. Nice Stone little, Varen. um, touch there as well as, uh, Varen uses her powers and it looks like the weave is coming from Moraine. It looks like Moraine's getting her powers back, but actually yes. it's Varen casting her weave to, to block the rest of the fades and that. Awesome fiery sword. Uh, it looks like something out of uh, out of good omens. Yeah, uh, the, exactly. The fiery sword to take out the fades yeah. from uh, from Tomas. I thought this battle with the fades was superb. Like they are I scary mean, as hell. They really they are. Great. And I, but even just them yeah. disappearing and, and then reforming mm-hmm. and how they went through the rock. Yeah. And like just 
they are powerful in and of their own right, and mm-hmm. they are absolutely relentless. And I really, really enjoyed this. Yeah. Um, you know, because basically, Moraine and Lan are pretty much sliced up here at this stage. I yeah. think, as I say, Moraine yeah. managed to get one of them. Lan managed to get another, but the third has to be stopped by Varen and, yeah. and Thomas with their weave. And yeah. Yeah. again, how that impacts, you know, the relationship between Moraine and Lan, you know, you she see him saying, yeah. yeah, what are you hiding from me? Mm-hmm. And it, it, as they travel to the White Tower, you know, it, it's interesting because it does cut back when uh, Adelaus and Varen are asking where they first met and mm-hmm. how they got to know one another. And there's, there's a moment where you can see between them a glimpse into what was there previously. Yeah. And then you just yeah. have uh, Moraine cutting land down saying, you know, you failed to protect me. Mm. And, um, you know, if you don't leave me, I will get Alana who has come from the white t- tower to collect land to break the bond mm-hmm. uh, by force. And, you know, it's really, it's cutting because it's not only that, it's you suddenly, you know, it, it's Moraine pushing him away for oh, sure. Yeah. But Lan saying, I always thought we were a partnership, mm-hmm. a, a warder and a I based on uh, equality equals. Yeah. Um, and she's like, we were never equal. Oh, so and much. it's so cutting yeah. here. Um, and yeah. it's really brutal. Yeah. Um, as she heads off to uh, do her own investigations, mm-hmm fine rand whatever it is that yeah. she's doing but and she reveals that as well to lan she reveals that she's been lying to him that she told him yeah. that rand was dead but actually she's doing that because yeah. her first um loyalty is to the dragon reborn um not to lan to get the dragon reborn to the final battle yeah, yeah. not the actual to the dragon yes reborn. yes but but get- absolutely not to lan i suppose is is what she's underlining here it's it's no, we were never equals, and I was never going to give you the information about Rand because you're not that important to me. He's more important, or that mission is more important to me than anything else. So, um, yeah, really cutting. It's it's like it it feels like the end of their relationship um, as it once was. Yeah, it, it, it's very it's very interesting. So the bit, the reason I brought the, the story to the fades was you see her. He reaches out for her when they're lying on the ground, and she does for a split second, and then pulls away. And here later, when they are just getting to the White Tower, and she goes hard against mm-hmm. this, you know, like pushing him further and further yeah. away. You can almost it's almost like she's doing it to make him want to go. Yeah. She's being as cutting, as mean, yeah. as vile as possible to drive him away so that he doesn't want to follow mm-hmm. her because she probably she cares for yeah. him. And again, like this is the like you can see that there's a there's a motive behind this. She's not just being despicable and mean for no reason. Yeah. The question is why? Like, is it that she's fears for him? Mm-hmm. Is it she thinks she's on a death sentence yeah. and she's a suicide run? And it's basically that. And because he will always, he'll follow her to the end of the well, earth. absolutely. He yeah, says yeah. as much. He says the oath is um, that he will die saving her. Yes. Like that is it, he believes that he will die no matter what. Um but she doesn't want that to happen it seems, but she is being as cruel as she can be to push him away. Yeah. Well that's it, but it, it's even like there's that other little scene between Moraine and Varin as well as they're looking out towards the white mm. tower. Um, and Varin has kind of clocked at what is going on here. Uh, you know, she's a great Aes Sedai and mm-hmm. I think is it's all about keepers of books and you it's here that Knowledge, she is yeah. yeah she's you hear she's writing a book um and she's <laughs> quite yeah. up front three fades haunting you um it's to do with the dragon reborn and you see moraine put the hand on her dagger it's just a really yeah. good scene how you know she says you know stay back put that away um and actually has from her learnings from her knowledge she's is there with moraine but i love how it's not set in stone she says i can't say i won't betray you because in the future that might be necessary Mm -hmm. plus there's all these (laughs) loopholes with you know having a a a a a trust and a bond uh, and you may have to do the same to me but in this moment i 
um, with you that our sisters are blind to the truth mm -hmm. um, and their incessant need to clip the dragon's wings, as she yes, describes it, it is not the... Is, is not the route that needs to be done. So yeah. she has an ally, but it's an ally that's not set in stone. I really yeah. just enjoyed this. I mean, absolutely. in fact, and I really enjoyed Mira Sile as Varen here. Oh, I think she was superb. Uh, and just a, I actually, a great actress. Really love seeing her yeah. in everything that she's in, yeah. And I actually preferred um, this introduction to the character. Oh, okay. um, I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, is it very I, different? It... It is different, well, like, yeah. um, but it just feels... I can get a sense that she's a real person. I mm -hmm. think she's quite standoffish in the books, at least initially, or where yeah. I'm up to. Right. But here... And she, she she is. You can see that... You can see that with her, but she's also... Because she's got Adelias there, there's a... She's the more sociable, the more mm -hmm. outward-going, and it pulls Varen in, and I, I like this introduction i didn't say yeah. it, they, 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 like varian being in play is a major character yeah like a, not now a, a kind of a moraine lan or Perrin, but enough that the, the introduction when I, I saw who it was playing yeah. her and i was like that's some top class casting Absolutely. and it i when where the character goes Based on who you know that that actress to be, mm -hmm. she has the the dramatic chops, the somewhat comedic, yeah. like she has the ability to be that quirky but also very direct, which we see. So we see her be across these three episodes. Mm -hmm. We see her go some of the jokes with the, the, her her ward and her other sister. Mm -hmm. You see uh, her. Do the very serious with the the kind of or the touching, I should say, the, the caring, yeah. where she talks about how when an Ace of Die is cut off from the source, it, it, the strength of Marine shows, mm -hmm. and then you do see her be the singular focused on history and knowledge when she talks about yeah. two Moraine standing in front of Tarvalon yeah. about kind of this is about the dragon reborn. I I get I understand you're not going to stop me and dissuade yeah. me. So you see these kind of bits. And again, this is the one of the reasons I love the Wheel of Time and it's also one of the reasons I'm really happy and enjoying what's in the show is that they're showing they 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 you could make this very campy. Oh yeah. Like you could, like it's magic swords and sorcery mm -hmm. with Trollocs, like with big, like beast mm -hmm. men, but they're, they're giving this level of gravitas with the actresses exactly. and the actors and like the, the, this, the, the overall scenes and the, 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 the everything about mm -hmm. it, the, the script, especially. Um, when I have the knowledge of what's potentially going to happen, I'm like, Oh, cool. This is going to do this. Right. And when they have that character who's just, killing it now is amazing mm. when they come to that later bit if they do right. that holy god that's going to be some <laughs> of the best tv in the right. year um so it's also that kind of knowledge yeah. but overall look at this this is fun and it's good to see where they're going with moraine yeah um and how they're going to bring her forward throughout the next couple of episodes in season Absolutely. two Absolutely, and i think specifically with um Varen's challenge back to moraine there I kind of like that it's Moraine who is the person that's well known for being able to twist the truth, even though Estelle's can't lie. It's Moraine that one, Moraine's always the one that finds those loopholes in a way that she bends the truth when she's speaking to others. Yeah, and Varen's telling her here, "I'm not going to lie to you. I also may break my oath in the future, <laughs> so you're just going to have to trust me." <laughs> Which is something that Moraine tends to find quite difficult to do is trust anybody, right? So uh, I really like that as a as a connection between those two characters so good stuff yeah yeah so should we move on to the next one the next book yes let's chat about the man and the wolf the yellow eyes parent this this for me was cool it, seeing him on the trail of Padden yes. Vane with loyal uh, kind of and the sniffers and the the rest of the, the the army trying to get the horn back because they the horn of valir is with 
with Pat and Yes, Bing. yes. I am um, so glad there was the preview section at the beginning of the first episode, which uh, showed what happened last season. Sorry, the the, uh, the replay previously on uh, from last season, so we could see Pat and Fane take the horn because they t- they talk about it so much. They drop you right into the story. Um, you even see Pat and Fane at the beginning in the Dark Council. You see him looking at the camera, and I was kind of going. Who's that guy again? <laughs> so luckily, I had the previously on that could have told that story because Patton Fine was in the background and you guys were telling me all last season. He's really important. Watch out for that guy. <laughs> and then you find out he's a dark friend towards the end of the season. And now they're, they're, he's on this dark council uh, of the chosen effectively. And this is, this is what propels all of Perrin's story is they're on the path trying to find him. Um, but have been lagging behind until they meet up with Elias the sniffer. And the Elias is interesting. Yeah. He he he's an important character. Uh first and foremost you see with Perrin, he he, he like Perrin, I should say, he has yellow eyes. Yes. Yeah. He he so and we then it's sprinkled throughout the, the, the episodes, you see him talk about understanding the difference between visions and reality. Yes. Um which Yes. This was this was really good. We we kind of had a little complaint or I had a little complaint about Perrin last season because I don't know the character from the books of course so my feeling the whole season was is he just going to wolf out make him wolf out turn him into a werewolf that's going to happen at some point but I really like how they developed this in the three episodes with Elias this idea that he can have visions he can see exactly what happened in the past but he can fall into them as well and feel like he's part of them he's seeing them live as they're happening let's say rather than yeah. him realizing their visions i thought that was really good and i think they did the connection to the wolves much better this season it feels like the pack is coming to rescue um perrin while when he's in danger i thought that worked yes. really well um much better than in last season it felt like an accident that wolves were circling around him whereas here it feels like that's part of his power is to draw them towards him which i thought was cool yeah yeah i I was so happy elias came in here um again uh wouldn't have been as a sniffer even though they could have used him i mean i do hope that they bring in the sniffer from book two hurin is his name okay he becomes quite um big character but I, I'm so glad they brought Elias in because, um, I, it was just, I think it, it adds much more, as you say, much more context for Perrin. Yeah. Um, I think having these moments through these episodes where he is seeing, um, you know, as he's closer to Elias, mm-hmm. uh, what has happened previously. Yeah. It's like uh, Elias is amping up his power. It's like the two of them together. It, Absolutely, his, his power is pushed greater than yeah. it would have been if he and wasn't doing it. Yeah. He's, but he's still questioning. He, you know, as he says, "What are you doing to me?" Um, and yeah, exactly. he feels this is being forced on him, or uh, without his consent, almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though it's something within him, which you see Ishmael say in the back of that kind of prison wagon, whereas and again. Yes. Another really interesting sort of bit of new stuff for me is where he says the closer you get, the closer you get to becoming a wolf, you know, the closer you are to me. Uh, and I, it's kind of interesting him saying that because there is this, um, sort of overriding aspect around the wolves is mm. that at least where I have gotten to it is that they are, definitely separate from they're kind of in between that they they choose to do their own things but they are um wary of trollocs and dark friends and right. so on so I, whether this is just ishmael messing with perrin's mind which is is half the point it's here. half of ishmael yeah. you know in a sense <laughs> yeah. he's trying to prevent him from getting to that because that would be a problem for Ishmael. He's know, trying to, to weaken him. Yeah, he's trying to get him to not form a pack. Yeah, around and him to d- yeah. to doubt that ability, so yeah. that he pushes against it or refuses to embrace it, yeah. and it's just really good. Like yeah. it is all this kind of uh, scheming from Ishmael that we Absolutely. see uh, it, it is just so good. Well, and- let's talk about that because that's quite a quite a big part of Perrin's story in here is uh, Ishmael and the the arrival of the Shenshin on uh, in this area of the world. Um, 
Yeah. So we that's that is the post credit scene that we saw at the end of last season. Their yes. ship arriving um yes. to the to the beach. I didn't go back and check and I meant to. I even said it to John. The kid that was on the beach, is that the young girl that, that is at the Dark Council meeting yes. or did they kill her? <laughs> no, there's not there's not the same. Oh, girl. Okay. I didn't go back different, and check, but I was wondering. Different. <laughs> um but we do we see yes, it is the Ascension uh, arrive, a, a fleet of them arrive. <laughs> And they, well, all we see, uh, which we now see more, is uh, chained women channeling the power mm-hmm. and using it as a weapon to create a tidal wave. Yes. Uh, and destroy the, whatever was on the beach, yeah. which in this case was a little girl. <laughs> yes. Because, <laughs> you know, that she, they, they, that, that little, little girl, girl could not stop survive. Them. She did not survive. No. Unless um, she had the power to, to weave the waves. I guess. Um, yeah, but that's a, yeah, that's a that's whole a other. Um, but but they, yeah, you're right. They they weave the wind effectively. We see them uh, using yeah. that as their power to subdue the folks in this town. And we hear in the speech from the Shanshan, they're um, they're taking back the land. They're saying they were pushed away from it. They've created their own empire and are now taking it back. Um, that these people are living on the land that's stolen from them, um, which is really interesting. Other dark force here, and interesting that. Ishmael has aligned himself with them. Um, he yeah. is the Dark One's closest ally, I guess, or closest lieutenant, um, and he's aligned with them, which I thought was a really interesting development here. Yeah, so they they mentioned very quickly on what they say is that they 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 left and are descendants of our uh, Hawkwing, um, and that they are coming back to reclaim them. Yeah, is Hawkwing an Avenger? <laughs> kind of, kind of. Kind okay. of. <laughs> <laughs> um but we do we see so we again they're just dropping hints and names here yeah, it was an interesting it, i think it was enough to just show you look they there's women on leashes mm-hmm. uh and they are their mouths are kind of covered and they're they're the channeling uh but there's women behind them in tattoos mm-hmm. holding those yeah. leashes those collars yeah. and basically almost yeah. like like a dog walker yeah. directing them where to go one of these girls is just going around pointing at other women mm-hmm. so you start to question why is she pointing at one woman versus another versus yeah. another well the, the assumption is that the, these girls can channel oh, okay yep so they're building the, it's an army very so good. that's very much what it's an empire very good. and the the um, interesting thing as well is you know we saw pad and fane at that dark friends meeting at the start we also see the long fingernails Mm -hmm. down below the tabletop of uh the leader the of the the senshan um seroth uh and of course she arrives with ishmael Mm -hmm. uh, but also the other interesting thing with this parent part is you do see the sort of the bird emblem uh of faldara Mm -hmm. uh, and they do come across uh one of those, uh, one of the Shinarans, um, as they're tracking Pat and Fane. So it's easy to think that it could be him who was also at the, the table. Mm. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it is. I think there may be someone higher up here, um, yeah. as well, um, which could be Ingtar here, who is yeah. the, the leader. I of, definitely of have these. my suspicions on, on Ingtar, the, the guy who's kind of leading this group, um, that parents now involved with it. Just, there's just some moments with him where he's kind of going, Oh no, we definitely should all just bow down. Our pride isn't worth our lives. And you're kind of going, but kind of is for a lot of these characters like a lot of these people have sworn their uh, allegiance to certain areas and certain places and armies and you're willing to just give that up at the mo- at a moment's notice um you know uno wasn't we saw what happened to uno in the most brutal scene i think that we've seen uh, in the show so far as he refuses to bow down to lady lady Shroth. um he gets a spike straight through his head and they kick it even further. Like it's a brutal scene when the camera lingers back on it and you see his entire jaw ripped open. It felt like something out of uh, Hellraiser. <laughs> it was really brutal. Looking. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. Mm. Yeah. I will say, I also don't believe my pride is worth my life. And after seeing that, I would absolutely bow down. I'd be just like all the rest of the villagers, <laughs> probably bow down before that <laughs> happened. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, but it's also, you know, you have Elias saying to Perrin that the Shinarans aren't your pack. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, at the, you know, so there's that side of it sort of throwing a bit of doubt on Perrin running with the Shinarans at the moment. But also at the village before... 
um, where they find the fade strung up mm. um, at, that makes them kind of leave there. And you see what Padden Fane has done to the people of that sort of farmstead. Right. Uh, as you see all the flies buzzing around, which I thought was really kind of, mm. you know, whilst you didn't really see anything, just having those flies there, you realize death, you know? Yeah. Um, and you have Ingtar saying, well, have you ever asked why um, Fane did what he did because you have this moment from Perrin where he's is is talking about how the people of the two rivers used to bring him in we're all chatty with him with share a beer Fane, yeah. uh, with Padden Fane and he sent the Trollocs uh, upon him and mm-hmm. Ingtar is trying to say well have you not thought about it from his perspective oh, why he's having to do this and you're yeah. kind of like okay I understand it could be complicated yeah. but what why would you say that? Yeah, that's leading to the moment when Perrin's strung up um, by Ingtar, and Ingtar's going, well, actually, they had my wife and kid prisoner. Uh, that's why I did what I did. <laughs> it's, it's leading to, it's setting a baseline for for his eventual excuse to yeah. Perrin as to why he's turned. Yeah, yeah. What, what was like. his reason? Uh, yeah. You might not like the answer, but is it worth asking that question? Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, that, that's somebody getting ready for an excuse, without a doubt. <laughs> good stuff uh, anything else on Perrin um, at this point no nothing on this again they, they, they're hinting at things especially at the end where he escapes mm-hmm. he escapes capture and he is uh, Elias is basically goes go go with this my brother yes and you see a wolf standing there and then he runs back into the to the fray yep. and Perrin runs off with the wolf mm-hmm. yeah yep. so we'll, we'll see where this goes so with now the pack yeah the pack yeah. and how that exchanges. Excellent. Does he go wolf mode? <laughs> I don't want to ruin things. Oh, yeah. don't. Please don't. Um, I'm, not going I'm, to. I'm like, glad it's fun. referencing things from the book, but I, I'd yes. rather not uh, have anything spoiled because the show's uh, no. doing a really good job of, of getting me excited for what could happen with these characters. Exactly. Speaking of excitement, let's get on to spoke number four, Nynaeve and Egwene. Ooh, this feels like quite a central story for these three episodes. Um, it's yeah. quite big, you know, this idea that they're now working, this idea that they've now become pledges effectively at the, at the White Tower, uh, to eventually become Aes Sedai. Both, both of them, both Nynaeve and Egwene. Um, Egwene being this really powerful weaver who was on the path to become an Aes Sedai. Nynaeve going along to support her and help her and then it turned out last season we found out how powerful Nynaeve actually is so both of them are here um, as pledges but interestingly Nynaeve has been here five months and has not tried to channel once um, whereas Egwene is trying with every single fibre of her being to channel and become a great Aes Sedai. I really liked this in the relationship uh, between the two of them that Nynaeve so reluctant yet everybody's pushing her to become the greatest channeler of all time you know i think that's a, a really interesting story for for naive um and yeah it's called out later on but the the jealousy of egwene coming out that people are ignoring yeah. her it was, it's like you know it's like going off to college and getting a great position in college and then you find out one of your mates is 10 times smarter than you uh you know yeah. it's like oh i used to be the the smartest one in, yeah. my, in my local town and now <laughs> i used to be the swat in the village exactly exactly yeah. and now this person who's not even trying um is better than me you know really really like that kind of storyline i also love how they do the weaving in this season i think it looks incredible it's like it's yeah. like they've worked they've like they've worked on that even more because it's being used so much more in the white tower as these um these kids are being trained into how to use it it feels like they've gone back and gone okay harry potter was able to make people walk around with sticks look like they're creating spells what can we do to make weaving look like a really powerful magic and i loved them pulling things together pulling the uh what's it the sand from the and the dust from the walls and the uh the water molecules from the air and weaving the two of them together to clean water a, a simple weave but it looks really it interesting does, yeah, yeah absolutely i i think like for me these two really interesting here and just that kind of i i guess just that thing that's come between them to some extent Mm -hmm. but i what i'm really enjoying is seeing Nynaeve in a sense kind of become a bit enchanted or familiar with leandrin here Mm. um i like how um she seems to see a a commonality between the two i mean it, it starts off with leandrin actually blocking uh 
Nynaeve in the kitchens and forming almost like a dagger around her so hand, cool. just saying, you know, why would I use swords when I can use this? Even mm-hmm. doing this, um, it expends my effort. And, and it means I have to fight hand to hand. I have better ways of killing someone. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and cool. you, but you see in that moment that whilst Nynaeve has not been able to channel when she's angry or afraid, mm. it just erupts out of her. And yeah. I mean, there's a great moment when Leandrin blocks her off and then brings it back in. And as she walks out of that kitchen, you can see it. it's almost like she does a little stumble because of what she's had to do, even though she's a full Aes Sedai yeah. with, with all that. But um, Nanive used her power against her. She pushed her back yeah, using exactly. the reactive power that she has, um, which was which was really interesting. Although this scene did make me laugh, I have to say, because effectively every saying Nanive hasn't um, channeled since she since she got to the White Terror. Um, they have the uh, I said I counsel or the training council, I guess, having a discussion about a way to get Nanive to channel. And Leandrin's going, well, maybe she just needed a better teacher. I'll go and have a talk to her. Leandrin walks in while Nynaeve is about to practice channeling and makes her stop. I just thought that was really funny because it's, <laughs> it's like this person hasn't even paid attention for five months. And the moment she's about to try something, uh, Leandrin walks into the room and goes, stop. Right. I have a proposal for you. <laughs> you can become the most powerful one. Like, let her try at least. <laughs> but it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Leandrin is like, you're here to learn about power. Like, and that's... Mm. Leandrin here you know it's about the power that she holds and mm-hmm. yet at the same time you know you have that moment where she's with her boy you know the weave keeps her young and you see her with this bed bound uh, older man with a beard mm-hmm. with the shakes and, and the spasms but again you have naive following Leandrin to see what she's up to that there's the whole element around the different use of herbs and so on like the wisdoms do mm-hmm. um and you, you you kind of see um a connection of course leandrin is is sort of packaging this all up with because i believe in you mm-hmm. you know yes you haven't been able to channel but you are one of the most powerful Aes that has come into the White Tower, and I believe that you can do it. And she's using her power of politics as well within the White Tower to make sure that, in effect, she fast-tracks Nynaeve to the acceptance ceremony uh, yeah. at the Archers as well. See, this is a bit harsh. So a novice died while Leandrum was training them effectively training and she's no longer allowed to train novices so she pushes Nynaeve who's never channeled intentionally to go through this trial that a lot of people have died in just so she can become an accepted and be trained by Leandrin. She's finding a loophole and pushing <laughs> Nynaeve through this awful trial. The trials are awesome sorry but it's yeah. a really difficult trial to go through, especially if you haven't, you know, learned a few tricks to, <laughs> to use the weaves, um, you know, potentially, or at least protect yourself somehow. Because they do say you can't use the weaves in the arches, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. she hasn't learned anything. It's like, you know, getting a, a kid in the first uh, in the first week of school to um, to do the tests at the end of the year, basically, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I think as w- it's because she's the most powerful. Yeah. She's the most powerful Chandler they've seen yeah. in hundreds yeah. of years and they call it out her Egwene Elaine yeah. are some of the most powerful women with abilities mm-hmm. uh, that it has come in hundreds of years yeah um, and that's again seen with these tests which we'll discuss mm-hmm. but like you're not supposed to be able to channel in these tests yes what does Nynaeve do at the very mm-hmm. end she channels exactly yeah. Yeah. and that's where you're like oh that's you're starting to see how powerful she mm-hmm. is. We've seen it at the end of season one. We're seeing it kind of when she pushes against the engine. Yeah. It's just raw power, exactly. but no control. Yeah. yeah. Um. And the question is, that's what Leandra talks about. She wants power. Mm-hmm. She will teach her naive about power and controlling power. Yeah. And you, you're led to, is it, is it good power she wants? Is it bad power? Mm-hmm. Like, it, there's a huge question mark under Leandrin. Um, so you're just seeing this, seeing her push 
And you're quite, the question is why? Yeah. You 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 want to know as a as a watcher yeah. why is the Andrew pushing her like this? Is there a more sinister element mm-hmm. to it? Yeah. yeah. To and get, that, like you said, fast track it. I think the the other thing I really liked is as the three eights to die there, the Andrew, you know, it's kind of laying out the rules of the game for uh-huh. for the archers, uh, the or the Tiandral uh, archers. And Leandrin's one is you must do it for yourself if you're going to be able to come through these tests. And everything leading up to this is the only reason that Nynaeve is there Mm -hmm. is to be with Egwene. She's doing it for Egwene and not for herself. Uh, So it's, I, I love that as we go into those trials of, of the archers. Absolutely. Does Nynaeve break all three of the major rules that are there? She can't. She's told that she can't channel in the arches. She's told yep. that she has to figure out why she's there to in order to yep. survive them, which she doesn't. She's there for somebody else, and she's told the exit will only appear once, and it appears twice for her. She has yes. the opportunity to get out a second time in uh, in one of the arches. So all three of the rules that they set for Nynaeve. And he breaks them all because she's a completely unknown entity, I guess. Yeah, she's someone that is completely different to uh, other channelers. Yeah, I think she certainly disrupts all those rules uh, to some extent, um, yeah. for sure. And I think Zoe Robbins here is excellent. I mean, I absolutely love the when she came, comes back from the last trial mm. uh, where she runs through she runs through the, the archway holding her daughter. Yeah. And as she comes through, it's gone. Yeah. It, she, and the first trial when she comes through and she's getting her sins washed away mm-hmm. and the water poured over, it's just like th- this sense of like not really knowing what's happening uh, and kind of going through it. Mm-hmm. I thought she played that so, so really good. well yeah. here. Yeah. Um, love Nanif. Yeah. Absolutely loved how yeah. she kind of portrayed that kind of confusion of going through these trials the heartache of certain aspects of them as well you know mm-hmm. the, you have the first trial where it's really it's about her mom and dad and being protected as a child and um, mm-hmm. and whether she should help them in their homestead uh, but instead the way back comes as she must make that decision yeah, they're attacked and killed by invaders, and she is downstairs um, and has to decide to stay with them or go. Uh, I do, I do kind of like that question that's going on, you know, as to whether this is a portal back through time that you could actually choose to save someone, or or to, a, or is it a portal to another place, or is it just visions? Are these things that you can interact with? She also travels um, to the two rivers um, and sees that a plague has attacked the village and is killing. Her friends and her and her family. Rand's father is dying, um, be, having been administered a, a effectively a killing uh, weed from uh, Matt's mother. Yes, which is interesting <laughs> um, that she's kind of going. I, I I've given up on uh, on saving these people, and Nynaeve realizing that they could all have been saved by the Aes Sedai if they use their power, they could have come to the two rivers and easily saved everybody there. But, but when she's offered yeah. in that moment, she can't weave within mm-hmm. the exactly. trial. Uh, I mean, the other side of it is, you know, these are Tiandril, the archers, and, you okay. know, they amplify the power. But there's a lot. It's almost like they know that much about them, but in mm. terms of the specifics you know, and they say a lot of people have died to fi- actually figure it out. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of trial and error. That it's not, they're not fully understood. And you have different, you know, there's Tiandrils, there is Angrils, and there's Sangrils as well. Mm-hmm. Um, not Sangria, but Sangrils. Okay. So, like, all connected to the, the different sides of the, the power and how they operate. So, again, you see in Trial 2 when Nynaeve wants to channel in order to help Tam uh, from his fever mm. because he's been administered this poisonous route, mm-hmm. then she can't. Yeah. And she doesn't. Whether that is to do with yeah. the Tiandril itself and the arches, as as she's been told by um, Leandril and the, the Master of Novices, or 
you know, it, it ultimately becomes too late as the, the one way back uh, appears and mm-hmm. she must break off and go back. Harsh though. Yeah. Tam's like, will you just stay with me while I, while I die? It's like, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, it'll, it'll be grand. I'll be back in a second. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> and then just legs it off through the, uh, through the gate, um, and ending that trial. So, um, but she does come out pleading for the Aes Sedai to go to two rivers. So she believes she has had a vision or it has been transported to two rivers, right? Mm hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's very confusing for, for her, I'd say, going in yeah. and out of these uh, moments in her life and uh, things she couldn't possibly know or couldn't possibly have But that's it, and I yeah. think it's captured so mm-hmm. well. It's all the fears, um, right? It, yeah. that, that's the whole thing. It's, it's all the fears that she has to face, um, which is why in the third trial, it seems like it's not a fear. It seems like it's something that she um, is willing to live in, that she meets with Lan, they... They get married, have a child. She has all of her friends surrounding her, including Matt and Perrin. Um, they're all living back in two rivers together. So she's living in almost a fantasy land with with Lan and chooses not to leave when she has the opportunity to. Yes. Yeah. Until the very end when, once again, two rivers gets attacked by the Trollocs uh, uh, and everybody is killed. We see Perrin dead. We see Matt dead and Lan, uh, Lan dead. And she's left holding her child. Um, so I do wonder about the time on this. I guess she's experiencing it like she has lived it all. This isn't yes. just one overnight stay there. It's it's like she's been in here with a child for a few years, effectively. So that's why, as you say, that moment when she comes out holding her child and the child disappears, you can really see the pain uh, on her because it was so real to her. Yeah. So I, I think they'll explain more in the next episode, but from that, essentially what I got, took from it as well, which is like she has lived, what, the child looks six to eight. Yeah. So she basically lived six to eight, nine, ten years yeah. in this world, in this reality, mm. uh, with Lan, with Matt, with Perrin, yeah. with Egwene, who was in the tower and going to fight mm-hmm. Trollocs. Um, and they're far away, but not that far. Yeah. Um, again, just, is it prophecy of the future? Mm. Is it not? Again, just all these different pieces, but seeing how naive when she comes out of that, um, to Elaine and Egwene, mm-hmm. like who were there to cap, to comfort her, but who had fallen asleep after what we can assume is Egwene tying herself out. Mm-hmm. Uh, channeling to the point of near exhaustion, trying to turn it back on to save Nine Yeah. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they play more of that and kind of, because again, Elaine is there now. She is the third. Yes. Yeah. Let, let's talk a quick, a quick bit about Elaine because I really like the character. Um, yes. Love, yeah. love the idea of this uh, daughter heir to an entire empire who had lived at the White Terror for some reason in the past, but just wants to get to know Egwene. Um, she's yeah. just arrived here. Uh, it, it, I, I suppose it's just because it's twisting what you would generally feel of the princess from the castle having to become a lowly servant. It kind of twists it a bit. She's actually okay with it. But it starts out that you feel like she's going to be this pompous ass. Basically, she comes in and has the whole room decorated and it's a tiny room like a broom closet. You know, of how can you live like this is how you start seeing her. But then over time, you realize actually she's well capable of dealing with these situations. And she's probably um, a much stronger person than Egwene seems in these moments. You know, Egwene's very pouty, very kind of annoyed and jealous as specifically called out by Elaine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Elaine's really good because she just, she brings something, something different to this table Mm -hmm. of Egwene and Nynaeve. And Mm -hmm. it is the fact that, you know, she has walked the corridors of power. She understands a bit more of that high society protocol. Yeah. Um, or the deafness of touch and diplomacy and so on, you know, certainly compared to Nynaeve. Mm-hmm. And this kind of just adds to the the weaponry that these three will have within this mm-hmm. world okay. and the bonds that they make. Mm. You know, it's like you say, when she calls out the jealousy of Egwene, she's like, I'm the heir to the the most powerful kingdom yeah. in the land. Uh-huh. I have seen jealousy. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. I know when I see it. Yeah. And I, just, I do I do like the gag from her as well that when she tells her who she is and goes, You're technically my subject. <laughs> I like that from, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. from her. So she yeah. is because Two Rivers is part of Adler. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. It is definitely an interesting one. Um Elaine's gonna play a major character. Yeah. I, I'm just telling you that name. <laughs> she rails. Yeah. She but it's fun because they they've they're turning some of these stereotypes that the fantasy stereotypes that you would have. And they like you you they play into it for the first few minutes. And then you do see when when the the mistress of novices mm-hmm. goes in and goes, Tell me who did it. Who let you in with all these yeah. things? And she's no. She's like, No, I'm going I'm going to accept my punishment. Yeah, I will take but the punishment still is, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But she's still smart about mm-hmm. it because she, she's a su- sass. Because she's like, would that be before or after? Absolutely. Yeah, I really like that. Really like that. Uh, yeah. So you, you kind of see that she, she has this diplomatic edge to mm-hmm. her, but at the same point is uh, just overall fantastic. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fun one. I really like her. And, and I, I think exactly as you said, Wheel of Time is that type of fantasy that is taking all of those tropes and flipping them, right? So uh, in general, in fantasy books, it's the... Um, princess in a tower that needs to be needs to be saved here the women the women are the people with power everybody that's that is able to weave properly is a woman and if a man tries to weave they go mad so uh, so i do like that 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 they've also brought in a princess literally who is able to weave here and has now formed a bond with uh, Egwene and presumably will with Nynaeve as well in the future. So yeah, uh, so really good. You're starting to take away some of the jeopardy, though, guys, um, from the books yeah. by saying all these characters form big parts. So what if they get in situations where they could die? Am I just supposed to assume they're not going to die because they play a no, part in the future? Because, <laughs> no, because that's what I, I'm finding interesting. They haven't introduced other characters. Right. Who should be alive and introduced by this part. So they may be skipping certain characters. They may be kind of merging characters and they may kill off characters that they feel like, do you know what? We could merge this storyline with this character and wait and see. So no, don't, don't take that just because we say they're an important character that they may not die. This is like, they also do game of Thrones level stuff right? where as we've seen with Uno, they're not afraid to kill people. Mm, off. Yeah. Like, so they will kill people. Right. So just good stuff. Take when I say she's important. <laughs> It, it, as a good she, thing. You get to see more of She's her. important in the books. They may change that for the series. Okay, cool. <laughs> exactly. So, speaking of important, let's move on to our final spoke in this wheel because we've managed to dance around perhaps the most important person in this world. <laughs> well, yeah. The Dragon Reborn. Randall Thor, who is back. Yes. He is alive and he is most definitely thriving. Let's call it that. Yeah. Now, I will say, I did write the notes for this, and I made him (laughs) spoke number five, Randall Thor. But he has, given that he is the Dragon Reborn, it's quite a simple storyline that's given to him here. We we see him uh, looking very hot uh, with his new uh, Justin Timberlake shaved head uh, from his curly hair last season, uh, trying to hide those those red curls um, from uh, the people that are searching for him. but he's made a new acquaintance or a new uh, a new love interest, I guess, in Celine. Um, although he does seem to be paying for room and board with sex, is what it kind of comes across with. Uh, yeah, pretty yeah, much. It's like you need to you need to pay this month's rent um, as they drop down to the bed together. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, hey, I guess I guess that's uh, that's what you do if you're uh, if you're on the run and your job is working as an orderly in a uh, in a a hospice taking care of male patients who've tried to weave and and broken their minds. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Because I guess it, to some degree, and certainly given his importance, I felt like slightly underserved here. Mm. But actually, you know, he does disappear for long tracks of of the book. Yes, yeah. actually, yeah. and I think you know, ultimately, he's in hiding. At least what that's what you. Th- you believe in Carhain, but his ultimate goal is to connect back with Loghain. Mm, the one thing I would say like is I actually loved his scenes with Errol, mm-hmm. the, the former swordsman. Um, cause yeah. just because, 
you know, you see them coming in for on on one particular day, and they're kind of having to go through the ritual of Errol having to trust him again because he sees the Aeel in Rand, and mm. um, he believes he's an ailment, and he, you know, and I really kind of enjoyed this. Can you remind um, me what an Aeel or an Aeelman is? Uh, a man from out uh, a different land, mm-hmm. but their distinct distinguishing characteristics of a eel are all they're all red. Yes, right. in right. season one there was but one they're... sort of um, hung up. He was dead at one of the villages yes. that the the Glee Man and uh, Rand and Matt went to. Mm-hmm. Um, it... Yes, um, and then we also saw uh, a uh, a eel woman, yes. a maiden of the spear. Yes. Take out a whole while pregnant. Yes. Take out a whole uh, f- legion of men, and then die under a sword. Pregnant with Rand, right? That yes. was his mother. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. correct. Yes. yes. That is uh, that. So Aiel are proper warriors. Known basically. warriors. Yeah. Like they are. That they are like. And again, you hear it when uh, the, the the gentleman is talking. Mm-hmm. The source master is talking. It's like especially the women. Yeah. So the women are known as maidens of spears as some of the fiercest warriors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I just thought this was really, really good. good. I mean, it was because it, it was just like it's good to reintroduce to the ailment and the. Mm-hmm. And, and all that. But I, I just thought it was quite touching between these two. I mean, yeah. ultimately, the goal for Rand was to get to Legain. But, you know, I like how after the other orderly has kind of shook Errol's confidence again, he kind of picks him up and, and says, well, he took us by surprise. What will you do to him next time as mm-hmm. he runs through the different sword uh, flourishes that he would do? So I just thought there was a really kind of nice moment because... You know, Rand is this hugely important character, uh, yet he is ultimately is you know he's from the two rivers, even mm-hmm. though his ancestry is is also very different. Yeah. And I, I kind of liked how this kind of just grounded him back down. It really showed his yeah. his caring side as well. I think that's yeah. that was important because he it is called out that he is there to meet Loghain. But he spent months doing this. I think it's it's roughly the same timeline, I guess, as the rest of the characters for so about five months, yeah? And um, potentially two or three of these yeah. he spent possibly every day having the same conversation with Errol, him being scared yeah. of the Aeel, but willing to deal with them and, and take care of him because he realizes that this could be Rand in the future. You know, in ten years' time, Rand could be sitting in a ward like this because uh he broke his mind trying to weave. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, the other big thing here is Celine. Um, you know, innocent innkeeper who just hmm. kind of likes the body or something more. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, very different from the book in terms of how this character is introduced. Yeah, I'm very suspicious of her. I must say, very <laughs> suspicious. Like, why would somebody fall for sexy Rand? Like, you know, there's no reason why she would be that attracted to this really attractive guy. She must be a dark friend. Yeah. Yes. But, like, also look at the <laughs> right at the end. She's like, oh, yeah. you don't scare me, channel, like, pushing Rand to channel, pushing yeah. him to kind of lose control. Wasn't that his dream? That's a question. I thought that yeah. was in his dream because she tells him to leave the jacket on. He'd already taken that off because he'd gone to visit Loghain in between the ball and the sex scene, effectively. So I think she's um, pushing him to channel in his dream and then he wakes up and sets fire to the inn uh, with the hottest wet dream ever, I guess. <laughs> the, yeah. the exact opposite of a wet dream, I is it? So. Uh, fire dream. Fiery, burning <laughs> yeah. type of wet yeah. dream. So, Usually stuff you get medication. Yeah, so I thought I thought that was, again, this throughout all of the stories for all of the characters, they're all having these visions in completely different ways. Some of them real, some of them dreams, some of them um, moments of the past, um, some of them traveling through arches to possibly hist- historical events that they could have changed, you know. So it's, it's a very different way of storytelling yeah. in, in The Wheel of Time. So sometimes it can be difficult to keep in line. I, I do feel like Perrin sometimes going... Okay, keep your visions and reality apart. <laughs> I do, I do yeah. feel though, Celine here is a bit on the nose. Okay, um, I do feel that the introduction here is a little bit more sort of obvious and mm. on the nose. 
and that she's someone that you need to pay attention to. Yeah, she could and be I, I, th- I think side. you okay. know, no, I think I think the books show that she's something to pay attention to, mm. but it's again, it's this notion of other things like the uh, like the like Loyal and his kind mm. that are aren't just purely associated with the one power, you know, the weave and the and the and the wheel of time, and you. She's introduced in a very different way, and I think it it makes her intriguing rather mm-hmm. than immediately kind of saying, "Oh, well, I think she could be a dark friend." Right? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I think it's probably because this happened before with Rand, didn't it? We saw we saw him sleeping in an inn, sleeping with an innkeeper who turned out to be a dark friend. So, because uh, that's repeating yeah. this season, <laughs> you're kind of instantly going, "Anybody that Rand sleeps with uh, is going to be a." Uh, a dark friend. Uh, well, I, I am, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he's just got yeah. very bad luck in love. <laughs> Can we just quickly talk about Loghain? Because we've kind of touched on it a few a few times here. So Rand's whole plan was to meet with Loghain and find out uh, how to channel the power. Uh, Loghain, if you remember, was back in season one. He was captured by the Aes Sedai and um, effectively punished for, for working for the Dark One and has gone mad with the use of the power. So this was the whole plan of Rand, was to get to Loghain and work out how to learn the power and how not to break his mind. Um, and after everything he does, it turns out the answer to the question is, well, you can't. I didn't I didn't uh, go through using the power and uh, and survive without breaking my mind. So uh, sorry, Rand. Um, that's going to happen to you as well. Well, at least... They're harsh. <laughs> Well, yeah, but at least Loghain can't control it. Yes, absolutely. couldn't control it. Yeah. Um, so... But it's it, kind of going to someone for advice... Exactly. ...that they couldn't even do themselves. Yeah. Probably not the greatest of plans, Rant. <laughs> either. <laughs> no. But, I mean, yes. And I guess to then him setting the inn on fire, it, almost, it, it underlines that point mm-hmm. of how he's not able to control no control yeah um but you know interestingly at least at this time and but interestingly as well you know the other person really that isn't in control of the weave is Nynaeve um, well exactly so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and she's that could be interesting powerful, as yeah. I say yeah. I don't know for sure um but I kind mm. of find the parallels a little interesting yeah Excellent. So that is, uh, that's Rand, I guess. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting to see where they take mm-hmm. this into the next. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, he just, he lost control. He channeled again. Yeah. And where, do, where does that bring us in episode four, five, six, mm-hmm. seven, eight? It's going to be fun. But gentlemen, we have touched on all major spokes. Mm-hmm. So any notes before we kind of discuss some kind of our final thoughts on all the first three episodes? The only one that I think we didn't didn't just mention, I think, is just when Perrin got captured and was uh, with Ishmael kind of forgot to say that uh, when he's freed by Elias, everybody else that was captured with him is being taken off by Ishmael. Um, they're yes. being dragged away, including Loyal. Our favourite little yes. librarian is, is uh, being dragged away. To so, Falm mm. on the coast, okay. which is probably mm-hmm. roughly, not exactly, but roughly where that tidal wave from the end of season one was. Oh, I see. Yes. yes. I see. Yeah. So I wonder what's going to happen with all them. We shall see. Hmm. Yes. It will be interesting to this. And um, the only other little note I have is again back to that dark council, that meeting. Mm. And because, you know, as I say, a great little way of doing it with the girl under the table, mm-hmm. seeing these glimpses of things. But, and we haven't seen them yet, we do see an Aes Sedai ring uh, and the color is black, the dark uh, Asia um, as well of the, the Aes Sedai that, you know, I guess. From season one, it's are these almost mythical, but certainly mm, okay. wouldn't uh, be okay. walking around the White Tower <laughs> with the black yeah. ring. No, you wouldn't. So interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah you do see an Aes Sedai ring. There. I did not notice it. Um, yeah, I have yeah. to uh, have to check that out uh, next time. Oh, we did also see uh, Nynaeve's Aes Sedai ring, the one that she was going to be. Uh, gifted was or was going to earn for becoming accepted. It's melted down by Leandrin yeah. as well. So now she yeah. no longer has an ICI ring. No, no. Well, do another one. one. Just do another one. Yeah. Be great. Knock fine. another it's, one up. It's all do it in post. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, gentlemen, we have spoken. Let's move on and ask the questions. Did you enjoy these first three episodes of Wheel of Time, John? 
Uh, yeah, I really did. Um, I give these three episodes in their entirety like four and a half possums out of five. Just referencing Min's little uh, what, little nickname for for Matt there. Um, it was <laughs> really sounds, sounds like Damon average. It show. does a bit. <laughs> I could try and do it in that accent. Hello, possums. Yeah, possums. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed uh, coming back to all these characters, mm-hmm. and and at the same time, you know. I'm probably a little kind of uh, in the middle of, of you two in that, you know, there are a lot of changes from the books I've read so far, mm. but it does feel immensely familiar about where they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it. You yeah. know, and the changes, I think, in the main are are really good. I think the only one I've probably got an exception uh, about for me personally is just Celine, I think. Um, yeah. I think she was much more mysterious in the books, mm. and I think... It's not to say she's not intriguing or anything like that, but I think uh, loyalties were, um, you know, were very hard to to pin down, if right. at all. Right. Um, Whereas they and, go and, to a bowl here, and someone walks over to rand some random stranger goes over and goes, uh, "Don't take any type of invites from that woman." <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like, hello, bad guy. So. <laughs> You know, but I, you know, I really like, um, having Elias there with Perrin. I loved Elias. Um, and, you know, I'm glad he's finally in season two. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Matt. I think the changeover of Matt has been so kind of just done really well yeah. and having him team up with Min. Uh, you know, the tension between Moraine and Lan, it, it, it's really good. I mean, it, it almost feels like, that rather than them coming back together, this is just going to break open mm-hmm. even further. And yep. it's a real, I think, great position to be in. I can see why these three episodes were released all at once. Absolutely. Like, a, a, as a block, I yeah. think they really do uh, make an awful lot of sense together. So, yeah, uh, four and a half possums out of five for me. Derek, uh, did you enjoy these episodes of Wheel of Time? I really enjoyed this. Um, it's great to be back in this world. Do you know what? I, when I watched the beginning of episode one, I was lost again and then realized <laughs> that the way they were doing it was introducing the character and then tell you how they got there. Introduce the character, tell you how they got there. So all I had to do was just sit back and watch the episodes. And once I did that, I think they were really well done yeah. i was trying to ask questions as the episode went on to discover where where everybody was who's this person who are they talking about here and they just answered those questions very well it was it flowed really well you mentioned about the three episodes being released that's prime video strategy for all their big shows but i feel like the first season they weren't told that whereas this season they knew exactly how the first episodes were going to be released so these three together did feel like a big movie it felt like they worked really well as a as a three episode drop in one day they kind of knew that's the way it was going to go it didn't seem like there was a big cliffhanger in episode one to move on to episode two it felt like they were uh, just written that way to to be watched uh three back to back so i'm glad we covered them that way i'm really glad to be back in this world looking forward to each week now for the next five weeks it's gonna be fun how about yourself chris did you enjoy these first three episodes of wheel of time i absolutely loved it Absolutely. Like, I, I think the second I text, uh, I watched the first two, uh-huh. uh, and then I was like, yeah, this is great. This is dark. This is, they're giving it the gravitas it needs, and they found their style. They found their writing style, direction style, kind of lighting, uh, costumes, the actors. Everything is kind of feels solidified, and they, they're happy with who they are as a kind of, kind of show. Uh, And it's coming together really well. Beyond that, it's also very quickly just showing us they're they're changing slight things that keep me on my toes. That Mm. makes me go, I think I know what's going to happen and how. So I'm I'm invested. And it's not just like I'm kind of rereading the books. Like it's not scene for scene for scene, which would be still good, but also... They're not going to get, as we said, 15, yeah. <laughs> or 15 years, books in 15 years. <laughs> yeah. So overall, absolutely loved it. and can't wait for the remaining of the episodes kind of this season. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, fellow wheelies and fellow quizzes, mm-hmm. uh, we have our Wheel of Time Tavern quiz for season two. Uh, and so we're going to kick off with three questions yeah. in rapid order. A so, big start, yeah. Yes, yeah. keep your ears peeled uh, in this case. Mm. Uh, so, three questions. Question one. 
How many marks in total does a Doman leave with after speaking with Moraine at Varen's house? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I like that. There's lots of lots of play in there from Moraine. It's a maths question, mm-hmm. shall we say? Yeah. Doman has two marks and <laughs> anyway. uh, question two. What two moves would Errol the patient do to Yan the orderly the next time he sees them? Ooh, that's a good one too. Lots that's a good one. question. I like so. that one. Mm-hmm. And question three, of course, we are in the tavern mm-hmm. quiz questions. So what wine does Legain request from Rand before he'll help him to control the one power? Very good. We always say, if you're watching a show the TV podcast industry is covering and we have a quiz on, just always check out the alcohol. That's yeah. being shown. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Good stuff. I uh, want to run through those one more time, John, quickly. Certainly. Question one. How many marks in total does Doman leave with after speaking with Moraine at Varen's house? Question two. What two moves would Errol the patient do to Yan the orderly the next time he sees him? And question three. What wine does Legain request from Rand before he'll help him to control the one power? Excellent stuff. Those are the first three questions of eight. All you need to do is put together the answers to all those at the end of the season and email us to feedback at TV Podcast Industries with all eight correct answers. And you could be in the chance of getting your hands on some Wheel of Time goodies. Yes. And speaking of feedback, we actually have a piece of feedback for this who came in. Don't forget, you can get yours read out on our podcast by emailing us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or head on over to our Facebook group and basically putting your feedback for each and every episode in the spoiler post. So the feedback comes from Dr. Bob Phillips, who had this to say. Our two-week rewatch schedule running into the new season was, I think, pretty much necessary to pick up the complex weave we've been represented with. Everyone seems to have a pattern that's growing away from each other, scattered as they are throughout the world, and each of them seem to be stranding themselves with a very amount of the dark. Highlights for me were the cute Trolloc chin chucking, the deep embarrassment of Egwene at the flirty pomegranate conversation uh, about finding your special self, seeing Lan at the kitchen baking, and Princess Novice managing to cut the crap and overturn some fantasy stereotypes. I predict an eventual return to turn up curry for Wolfie, access to the seat for Egg, a red, gold, and green patchwork cloak for our young wisdom, fluffier locks and a firebrand power to defeat the lieutenant, and Matty being rescued from the kleptomania and doomed by the need to save a small child from the maw of a monster. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Wow, that's um, some predictions. I'm not uh-huh. going to answer any of those. <laughs> but what I did say, yes, good point on the uh, flirty Egwene conversation. I completely forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, that was one. The Lana. That was a, yeah, Lana, that was, that was a good one. Yeah. Especially you can see how embarrassed she gets uh, in the miscommunication. Just that's let really yourself good. go and enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was a difficult gag to pick up, though, because you only saw um, Egwene in her room for about two seconds. Uh, um, it was before you were introduced to her, even. So, so when it comes back around and you realize that um, they've had a miscommunication between what happened in the classroom and what happened in her bedroom in the morning, uh, I, I thought it was difficult to pick up. But, yeah, yeah, and I have to say now, Dr. Bob, I went to a much darker place with that opening of the cute trollic chin chucking. Um, oh, yeah. Because yeah. I actually literally couldn't watch the screen because I thought that whilst the trollic was all kind of like letting Ishmael's hand kind of rub all over him like a Mm -hmm. you know sort of tickling a cat uh, on the back of its neck I thought it was just going to bite the hand off the little kid I was convinced (laughs) this wasn't going to end well Uh, a bit like Tidal Wave Susan uh, at the end of season one yeah yeah. and that uh, this wasn't going to end well for the the little kid there absolutely yeah good stuff thanks Dr. Bob thanks Dr. Bob we also have some feedback from Coffee and Vodka over on our email who says greetings fellow Bucket Brigade defenders so it begins with the themes of separation struggle and withdrawal pain also of reacquaintance and remembering names roles and motivations <laughs> mm-hmm. these past few years I've learnt confirmation of series renewal do- alone doesn't mean anything until it's on the screen it doesn't exist and I wasn't sure Wheel of Time would make it out of the gates unaffected by the writers and actors strike Hashtag support the union. Mm-hmm. Life imitating art. 
it was a good proper introduction giving us a clear look at evil on the move and good on its back foot seemingly all but unprepared the path for the series likewise seems clear get the band back together all the while healing and learning face the darkness to maybe get back into the light my hail mary prediction is leandrin turning from heel to hero Mm. so what do you think of this dire beginning four fade felled moraines nullified naineves and perilously pugnacious perrins out of five peace and take care coffee and vodka thanks so much coffee and vodka Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that's a pretty good prediction that we'll see Leandrin become a, a hero uh, later on in the series. I think that's kind of where you'd put a character like this. She seemed to be very manipulative, seems to be the dark one, um, but potentially that's a that's a good character to to turn on her her heels. Maybe, mm. maybe, maybe. I know, I know. I'm not asking for an answer. No, I know, I know. No, I, <laughs> I honestly, promise. I don't know. I'm, I don't yeah. know what they're going to do with this character. Yeah. No. Because I I know well, I know what the char- I know what the character does, but I don't mm-hmm. know what the Rafe Judkins and all them are going to do with them. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. I know where she is at the moment by sort of three quarters of the way through book four. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Great stuff. And and I, I, just to your point, Coffee Vodka, that uh, yeah, you never really know when a series gets renewed, renewed whether it's going to appear next season. Prime Video, I think themselves cancelled two shows that were renewed for uh, for next season. So. Um, at least we have this. We know eight episodes are coming. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Definitely. Exactly. So all good. And yes, hopefully everybody gets back to work soon once they get paid for their jobs, uh, which they should be, of course. So yes. uh, yeah, agreed with your hashtag support the union. That's it, I think, uh, for our feedback section. It yes. is. Yes. So that is it. We will be back next week for episode four of The Wheel of Time. And we will also be back for episode four of Ahsoka which we are mm-hmm. also covering, which is over on Disney+. Plus. Yes, so we're covering two at the moment, and the boys just finished their coverage of Good Omens Season 2, we which did. was also out on Prime Video. Yes. So if you enjoyed Good Omens Season 1 and or Good Omens Season 2, make sure you pop on over and listen to that podcast. It is shockingly good. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Yes, thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back next week. Looking forward to seeing you. Yes, thank you so much. And we'll speak to you again soon. Yes. Uh, Good stuff, fellow wheelies. And thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, keep watching, keep listening. And of course, keep wheeling. Bye. Bye. Bye.